In December 1965, a report was created by the UK Technical Committee as an inquiry into the welfare of animals that were being kept in intensive livestock systems. The results of this report would go on to change animal welfare standards worldwide. These standards went on to become the foundations for the five freedoms. Freedom from discomfort, freedom from hunger or thirst, freedom to express normal behaviour, freedom from fear or distress, and finally freedom from pain, injury and disease. These five freedoms revolutionised the welfare standards as they could help provide a generalised concept of what are acceptable standards for animal welfare. This affected every single animal owner, from large-scale collections such as zoos and wildlife centres all the way down to the public and their own beloved pets. These five freedoms helped form the basis of the Zoo Licensing Act, which was created in 1981. This act sets the legal standards of which zoos must pass in order to stay open. The standards are inspected on a regular basis and licensing is renewed every six years if the standards are being upheld. For a zoo to remain open, they legally must have this license. This ensures that all zoos in Britain and Ireland are upholding their animals' welfare to the highest standard possible. To obtain this license, zoos must meet the five freedoms along with the conservation requirements, which are keeping animals in a suitable environment for their species, making sure all enclosures are in good, secure and suitable conditions, making sure all food is stored properly and everything is clean to stop pests and vermin, keeping accurate records of the zoo's collection and help educate the public about the importance of biodiversity in the wild. Out of everything to do with the welfare of the animals in a zoo, there is one single thing that is without a doubt the most important factor in it all. Without this, the animals would not have a fraction of the quality of life that they have. These people are the reasons that animals in zoos all around the world don't starve. They are the reason all the enclosures are spotless and clean, and most of all, they make sure that these animals' welfare is the most important thing in the zoo. Their job and work are often overlooked, underappreciated, and even on occasions forgotten about. They are, of course, our keepers. These amazing group of people work day in, day out to make sure everything inside a zoo is running as smoothly as possible, making sure every animal is getting its nutritional needs, as well as making sure every enclosure is spotless and tidy for the public. They also act as teachers inside the zoo, educating the public about the importance of biodiversity in the wild, the importance of breeding and release programmes and conservation in the wild, and what vital roles zoos have in the success of these programmes. Nothing in the zoo would be possible without this team of amazing people and they deserve all the recognition and respect they can get. As mentioned before, all zoos have welfare standards which are used to ensure that all animals in the zoo are in suitable environments for their species. Once again, it is the keepers who are responsible for making sure that these standards are constantly being met. Here we can see roughly what a welfare sheet looks like. It contains a list of standards and conditions for the animal's enclosure and if the zoo is meeting these standards or not. As well as making sure all the animals in the zoo are happy and healthy, the keepers also have to help keep accurate records of all the animals in the zoo. Through systems like Zims, the keepers can help keep accurate records of all the animals that are presently in the zoo. They also work closely with programs such as EEPS and ESB to help with captive breeding to increase population numbers and help genetic health of animals in zoo care. Being the carnivorous hunter that they are, it is no surprise to us that the otter's main food source is fish and your smaller shelled crustaceans such as clams, shrimp, mussels, pretty much anything they can find at the bottom of a river. Now to help them catch fish, otters have evolved to have a very quick reaction time as well as highly sensitive whiskers. As visibility underwater is very poor, they can use their whiskers to sense vibrations and movements around them. They will then use their quick reaction time to snap in the direction of this movement. Using these reflexes along with their razor sharp teeth and claws results in the otter becoming a very, very successful predator for its small size. In the wild, they'll go hunting for around 6-8 to eight hours daily and can eat anywhere from 15-25% to 25 of their body weight daily too. As you can see, these little guys can eat a lot in a single day, which is why they always seem to be so hungry in zoos, but I can assure you they do get fed, no matter how hungry they might be acting. The otters here at Camperdown get fed four times daily, twice in the morning and twice in the afternoon, and the keepers do everything they can to mimic their natural diet. However, in the wild, otters can develop vitamin deficiencies as the diet, being made up of purely meat, cannot provide every nutritional need that otters require. 
In order to combat these nutritional deficiencies, zoos will use fruits and vegetable supplements along with fish, crustacean and eggs to maintain a balanced and nutrition-rich diet for the otters. In order to mimic the natural feeding habits as best as we can, there are a few tricks that zoos can use. With otters being aquatic animals as well as being able to come onto land, we can use both of these environments to our advantage when feeding. Starting with on land, there are certain strategies that we can use to mimic their natural instincts. This is as simple as hiding or scattering their food so they have to actively search for it. This will help promote their natural foraging abilities as well as help them to prolong their feeding time. We can also use the water in their enclosure to our advantage by scattering clams and mussels on the bottom of the pool. This helps encourage the otters to dive down and forage underwater. Once they have collected their food, they can then use pebbles that can be found in their enclosure to break the shells open to get to the meat inside. Once again, this mimics exactly what we do in the wild and will really help to reinforce their natural abilities and habits, which at the end of the day is what every zoo is striving to do. The development of uncharacteristic behaviours in captive animals is probably one of the largest threats to rehabilitation and release programmes that are present in zoo collections. An uncharacteristic behaviour can be anything from the animals predicting feeding times and therefore starting to call or beg around these hours all the way to the animals physically letting you touch and hold them. These behaviours might look and seem cute and funny to the public, but they can impact the nature of the animal so severely that it would stand no chance of being released into the wild. In extreme circumstances, some animals are so used to human company that they actually suffer when they are placed with their own species as they do not know how to socialise or act accordingly. The development of these behaviours can begin from the smallest things. For example, Begging for food when it gets near feeding time is developed from feeding them at the same time every day. It really is as simple as trying to work around little things like this that can help prevent the development of these uncharacteristic behaviours that would eventually change the future of these animals' lives. When talking about the manifestation of uncharacteristic behaviours, one of the most commonly mentioned things is hand rearing the animals. This is one of the hardest things to deal with as we cannot just simply leave and abandon this baby animal to die. Yet, if we are not careful on how we hand raise it, we might already be sealing its fate when we take it in. The issue with hand rearing animals from birth is that if it is not done correctly, then the animal may never be able to survive in the wild or with its own kind in captivity. The young animal cannot learn its own species communication skills from humans, nor can it learn to hunt and forage from humans either. Ideally, they need a parental figure from their own species that can teach them everything they need to know. Otherwise, the young animal will rely too heavily on human help, which, of course, is the exact opposite of which zoos and conservation programs want to promote. However, uncharacteristic behaviours caused by hand-rearing animals or behaviours that have happened naturally in captive animals as they've gotten used to the keepers can be slowed down and prevented from happening. Hand-rearing can be done with as little human interaction as possible and a lot of rehabilitation centres for young abandoned animals do this. They will use the stuffed animal of the species they are raising to mimic the mother so that the young animal does not become accustomed to a human parental figure. When it is feeding time, they will scatter the food around so that the animal has to search for it and cannot just go to a food station to find it. They will play sounds the species would make so it will help the young animal get used to socialisation methods which will then make their transition into larger groups of their own species a lot easier as they will already know how to act accordingly. For already captive animals, there are several different methods that we can use to help delay the onset of uncharacteristic behaviours. For instance, placing meat inside cardboard animals so that the predator species have to actively hunt to get the meat, rather than just walking over and picking up chunks of meat from the ground, as well as herbivore species which can be trained to forage by hiding their food around the enclosure and in toys rather than just placing it in locations. This of course results in them using their natural foraging behaviours. Doing little things like this, along with mixing up feeding times daily, can help stop and prevent the manifestation of uncharacteristic behaviours in already captive animals. Unfortunately, we will never be able to stop the development of these uncharacteristic behaviours in captive and hand rear animals completely, and some of them may never return to the wild. But, if we can focus on delaying these behaviours appearing in new and future animals, then hopefully we can continue to release them back into the wild and secure a future for biodiversity.